Good morning. Super to see you, as always. Welcome to Christ Church. We're delighted to have you with us, sharing in our worship on this, the Lord's Day. If you are visiting with us today, we bid you a particularly warm welcome. We're delighted to have guests, and we hope whether you're a regular or a guest, that after service you'll find your way through to Fellowship Hall to enjoy one another and the good things that are provided there for us. Also, immediately after service, uh, we have uh, each week a prayer ministry, deacons and elders available in total confidentiality to bring any prayer concerns you may have before God's throne of grace. And that takes place at the uh, room at the back of, on my left-hand side at the back of the church, just under the exit sign there. Uh, go and uh, there'll be an officer waiting there to share in the ministry of prayer. If you are a visitor, and if you do feel comfortable doing so, we would love for you to stand, and I'll go around the room and just uh, ask for your name and where it is you come from. Uh, it's amazing how often this enables some connection to be made between different people who are joining in our service uh, each Lord's Day. So if you're visiting and if you're comfortable, now's the moment to stand, and we'll find out who you are and where you come from. I guess the ushers shunt all the visitors to the <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, folks. Yes. Uh, my name is Steve Schwein. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's my wife, Lynn. From Milwaukee. Yes. Terrific. Welcome. Yes, folks. Julie and John Monk from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. More Wisconsin people. Terrific. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Carolyn Milroy from Michigan. From Michigan. Terrific. Do you know each other? <laughs> you soon will. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Andy Marku from outside of Boston. From Boston. Terrific. Oh, outside of Boston. Thank you. There's a difference, is there? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't catch any of that. Jersey Shore. Terrific. Thank you. Yes, folks. Outside where? Boulder, Colorado. Oh, Boulder, Colorado, Boulder. Terrific. There may be other visitors who were nervous about standing. I don't understand why, but <laughs> let's include them in our welcome. And at this point in the service, this would be a great moment, if you've not already done so, to take the fellowship pads, sign in, and pass them along the row, and then when they get to the other end, pass them back again, and you're allowed to read what the people sitting near you have written. Uh, we hope that that will encourage you to greet one another personally at the end of the service. A couple of announcements quickly, just to bring to your attention, special Sunday next week. Next Sunday, the choir uh, present uh, a musical reflection on the suffering and death of Jesus, uh, Hope in the Shadows, a narrative interpreted by so some beautiful music, and that will take up what, three quarters of the service, Robert, you're, you're gunning for next week? Yes, um, terrific. Um, so invite your friends, your neighbors. It will be a beautiful, reflective, uh, meditative service. And then uh, after the worship is over, on the other corner of the, uh, the, the sanctuary, there's another door, and through that, uh, we'll hold a Connect class, uh, an opportunity to sit down and just ask any questions you may have about Christ Church or how you might uh, more closely uh, connect with the congregation. No obligation. It's a pure information meeting. Anyone is uh, welcome. Tomorrow, our Hope Seeds group uh, meet at 1 p.m., uh, and to enable proper planning for the meeting to take place, uh, it's, gr it's great if you can sign up. One of the lovely things about Hope Seed is some Christians worry about some mission uh, endeavors taking away the initiative of uh, the, the recipients, you know? Uh, Western Christians come in with all the answers and that, that kind of stuff. Hope Seeds is the very opposite. We give good quality seeds to people and then leave them 
to plant, to nurture, to harvest, and to use. It's very much an empowering ministry, and uh, for very small effort on our part, apart from those who do all the organizing, um, it, it has great payback, and uh, we commend the efforts to you. And then, uh, advance notice uh, on um, Thursday, April 13, we have our going away party. I know it seems like only the day before yesterday we were welcoming our snowbirds and our seasonal visitors, and already we're looking forward, or oh, not looking forward, we're... <laughs> Hey, hey, you, you, you do. <laughs> oh. Would anyone mind if I left now? <laughs> we are anticipating the fact that we have to say goodbye for a few months only uh, to, to some of our seasonal people. So we'd love to have you um, sign up in Fellowship Hall. Uh, it's 5 p.m. Thursday, April 13. And again, advance notice is to enable, to enable us to plan uh, carefully for that event. Then one, one additional announcement. One of the things that various churches in the Peace River Presbytery do is support the uh, migrant farm workers uh, at, at Bethel. And uh, different congregations take different days uh, to go and serve lunch in the fields to the workers. And uh, we are signed up to do so this coming Thursday, March 23. And one, we, we've got volunteers who almost jostle with one another to make sure they take part in uh, the day we serve uh, lunch to the farm workers. But one or two of our regulars have had to drop out, and so there are a couple of vacancies. Uh, Jerry Fox will be in Fellowship Hall after the service. Uh, See Jerry. If you don't know who Jerry is, one of the officers, one of the people standing behind the tables in Fellowship Hall will point him out, and uh, he will be very happy to receive your uh, offer of voluntary service. Lots of other things going on in the life of the congregation, uh, lots of good things. Uh, check out the announcement that you have with the bulletin today, and uh, if you feel drawn to take part, please be assured of a very warm welcome. And we look forward to your ongoing connection with Christ Church of Longboat Key. But we gather as a community of faith to express our faith through the worship of our God. Friends, together, let us worship God. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to God Most High, for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the company of all God's people.
Please be seated. In the assurance that God delights to hear and answer prayer, we make confession to our God as we join together and pray. Forgive us, loving Father. We are not the people you are calling us to be. We feel overwhelmed by the noise and confusion of the world and fail to find our peace in you. We become preoccupied with all our busyness and miss the still small voice that centers us in you. We become confused by competing values all around us and miss the distinctive life of faith to which you call us. In these ways, we fail to bear the confident witness to your grace which you have given us. Forgive us, loving Father. Friends, each time we turn to God in penitence and faith, God offers full and free forgiveness. In joy and gladness we affirm, God forgives us all for Jesus' sake. Just for the record, I'm not John Grimes. He was unable to make it today. Our first reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do these people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Amen. Our reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, finds Paul in prison and writing to the congregation at Philippi that he loves dearly and seeking to allay the concerns his friends are feeling about his safety and his well-being. So Philippians 1, beginning in verse 12. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, 
that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
last of the seven marks of vital congregations is ecclesial health, overall congregational health. And we're going to approach it today through the beatitude in Matthew 5, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Christian news magazines, and in addition, some theological journals, have had worrying reading in them lately. Across the country, church attendance has not recovered from the shutdowns and restrictions the pandemic caused. Pastors, bruised by the pandemic and battered by the way pandemic politics invaded many congregations, are contemplating quitting their ministries and finding less stressful work. Apparently, tons of them. And those of us still standing find it daunting to be thinking ahead to Easter preaching and finding a professor of preaching, no less, telling us, I understand some of you approach this coming Easter Sunday with trepidation. And she doesn't mean the trepidation that preaching Easter is always challenging nor because Easter is earlier this year. I'm not quite sure how she works that out, but anyway, she claims Easter is earlier this year. And then she goes on, rather, some of you are already apprehensive about preaching Easter Sunday because we are not back to normal, and we are not sure that we will ever be back to normal. Ted Bolsinger agrees. He's a congregational consultant and strategist and associate professor of leadership formation at Fuller Theological Seminary. And he understands that Christian churches today are facing what he calls circumstances unprecedented in their complexity. He says, as one person reminded me, it was like we were in 1918 and the health crisis of the Spanish flu, 1929, the financial crisis of the, the year, and 1968, a crisis of social injustice that led to deep political and social division all at the same time. And then Bosinger adds, as I write this, the world is also watching on in horror as a massive superpower has invaded a neighboring country. So we might add 1939 to the table of disturbing dates. See what he's saying? All the worst years of the 20th century rolled into one. And to help us, Bossinger offers a concept from Susan Beaumont's book, <laughs> wonderful title, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. <laughs> and the concept he offers us is liminal space. Now, the word liminal comes straight from Latin. It means a threshold. Liminal space is like standing at an open door. The familiar surroundings, the familiar people are behind you, and beyond the open door, who knows what's out there? Beaumont says, we feel like we are at the moment of sunrise and our eyes haven't yet adjusted to the light. 
So the times are tough. And the future isn't what it used to be. You know what? Nothing new in that. I think you can make a case that the entire New Testament and all the people featured in it are caught up in a massive liminal space, a massive transitional moment when the old and familiar recedes and an entirely new and unprecedented future beckons. The step from BC to AD is an immense liminal space. James S. Stewart once described the coming of Christ as the event that broke the very backbone of history. The familiar, the tried and tested, yielded to unprecedented newness. You can illustrate that from all over the New Testament, but take the Beatitudes, for instance. The world's wisdom, blessed are the assertive, becomes blessed are the poor in spirit. The world's blessed are the hard-skinned is replaced by blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the troublemakers yields before blessed are the peacemakers. It's a new day and a new way to engage in God's way. And if you go through the rest of the teaching of Jesus, or if you reflect on many of the encounters Jesus engaged in, you see strange and unexpected newness breaking out all over the place. Take today's readings. Caesarea Philippi, was liminal space. Peter, Peter's elation at being the first to recognize Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah is then, in the verses immediately following our reading today, crushed by the consternation of hearing Jesus talk about his coming cross. Peter, and then the others, had to get their heads around replacing a conquering Messiah with a crucified Messiah. Now, to be sure, the crucified Messiah is still going to conquer only by sacrifice, not by slaughter, by love, not by warfare. He will usher in God's kingdom by reconciliation, not rejection or estrangement. And the peacemaking that Jesus embodies is both the peacemaking of reconciliation, replacing enmity with cooperation, but also the peace with God, which brings the peace of God into human hearts and lives. Some commentators argue as to which interpretation of peacemaker is correct. And it seems to me that both are. One of the, one of the passages I almost selected for today's service is the second half of Ephesians chapter 2 where the apostle speaks of the reconciliation Jesus effected between Jews and Gentiles, proclaiming peace to those who are far off and peace to those who were near, breaking down the hostility that used to divide them. So, social reconciliation. But that back of those divisions, behind every conflict, 
cause of all the enmity and strife and divisiveness is the brokenness and self-centeredness we call sin. And Jesus died to take away our sin, for he is our peace, Ephesians 2.14 proclaims. So that Jesus is both redemption and reconciliation, peace with God. And then because of peace with God, peace with our neighbor. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, he's telling us that the work of Christian peacemaking is twofold. It can be social and relational, seeking to bridge conflicts, reconcile differences, heal breaches, and bring people together. That, of course, will call for less strident Christianity, fewer world-imitating strategies, and much more humble modeling of peace, peace with God and with one another. And you don't need me to tell you that that is hugely important work in our divided world. But even more important is the theological and missional peacemaking, bringing people to God and sharing the salvation offered us in Christ. Because the lostness and the loneliness and the addictions and the confusions and the sheer emptiness that many people live in cry out for the peace of God that is beyond understanding. And Paul models that for us. In the liminal space, he finds himself in. Boy, Paul knew exactly what he was talking about when he wrote in 2 Corinthians, when anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Jesus brought newness to Paul in an extraordinary way. Gone was the old pride in his Jewish pedigree. Gone the old legalisms and all the boxes Paul had ticked in his striving to win righteousness with God by his own efforts. And in their place, a new everything, a new name, a new faith justified by grace through faith, a new career, missionary extraordinary, traveling the world, planting churches, writing letters that still today inspire. And then, bam, he's thrown into prison. His ministry comes to a crashing halt. You'd think he'd be depressed, deflated, maybe even suicidal. Things could hardly be worse for Paul, you'd think. And yet, as he writes his letter to the Philippians, he's so filled with faith and confidence and joy that that letter is the most positive thing Paul ever wrote, pulsating with faith and hope and love. And he's full of wonder as he sees the gospel advance into sectors of society which otherwise it might never have penetrated. And he realizes with joy that God is at work. The gospel is spreading and faith is advancing even in liminal space. 
After all, during his imprisonment, he tells us, many Roman officers and soldiers have heard about his case, and through it, heard about Jesus. In addition, as Acts tells us, two Roman governors and King Herod Agrippa and their wives have heard Paul. And one of these governors used to send for him frequently to talk about his faith. And in addition, the local church where his imprisonment is, is all fired up and reaching out to others in confidence and offering faith. Paul in prison is at peace with God. And he models peacemaking. Did you notice? There are troublemakers at work, rival preachers, stirring up controversy that will cast Christianity in a bad light with the public. They hope to prejudice Paul's trial. Wow. So-called Christian preachers. Paul doesn't care. What does it matter, he writes, just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that I rejoice. There's Paul's great faith in a great God who can work in the most unlikely of situations and with the most unpromising of people. And there, in a nutshell, is the secret of a vital church, Christ, the peace of God. When Fred Craddock was in seminary, Part of his prescribed reading was Albert Schweitzer's book, Quest for the Historical Jesus. The world-renowned musician, philosopher, missionary, had written a book that became very controversial and, according to many people, was even heretical. And as he worked through it, Craddock did not like it. And then one day he read in the local paper that Dr. Schweitzer was coming to Cleveland, Ohio to do an organ recital. He was a world expert in Bach, after all. And there was going to be a reception afterwards where people could meet the famous man. Craddock couldn't wait. He got out his book. He got all the notes he'd made on Schweitzer's book and framed a series of critical questions. He attended the concert, and then afterwards sat in the front row of the fellowship hall. This was going to be a major confrontation. He recalls, finally Schweitzer came in with a cup of tea. He was about 75 years old. His hair was white and long. His mustache was bushy, I think about 75. I had my questions. Surely there would be question answer time. He got up and said, I thank you for your hospitality, for your gracious reception of me, but I have to go back to Lamborghini in Africa my people there are dying. They are sick and hungry. If any of you have in you the love of Jesus, come help me. Craddock says, I looked at my questions. Of all the stupid, silly stuff that I was going to ask this man,
it seems to me that when Christians find the headwinds too strong, they often major on minors. You know, we need a new worship style, a different Bible, perhaps. Oh, a Saturday night service might bring them in. Oh, better coffee would do that. Hey, let's hire a praise band. I believe Jesus wants us to major on majors. Okay, the times are tough. But friends, we are not the only people in America today who find the times are tough, the future uncertain, the way forward confusing. We're not the only people in that mode. But Christians are the only people with the peace of God. In our living, in our praying, in our learning, in our serving, in our witnessing, we have the peace of God to share with a hurting world. Friends, let's be peacemakers. Let's spread the peace of God around. Let us pray. Lord, by the grace that grasps us in Christ, fill us with your peace and send us with that peace to reconcile your children one to the other above all the silly divisions of our time. And more deeply still, to reconcile them to you, our God, who in Christ has wrapped us in eternal love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
be seated. And in response to the blessings God has showered upon us, we bring our offerings for God's work in the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> From the gifts that God has given, we offer these to God for the work to which God calls him in and through his church on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our worship as we bring our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession to God. Most generous God, robed in majesty and clothed in humility, worthy of our praise for the love with which you bless us and the grace in which you hold us. Accept the thanks and praise we offer you this day. Thank you for your grace and love. Your love before us as example, and your grace within us as encouragement. Thank you for Jesus and his ministry, inspiring us to live beyond ourselves, helping us to learn to love our neighbor. Thank you for Christ's death and resurrection, enfolding us in all the richness 
of your sacrificial, self-giving love. And after Jesus, thank you for all who have encouraged us in the way of Jesus. Parents, teachers, friends, and all who challenge us to service in the name of Jesus. Hear our prayers for others, loving God. We pray for peace in the places of conflict. We pray for reconciliation in the places of enmity. We pray for justice where there is oppression and generous sharing where there is want. And we ask your blessing, loving God, on all your children placed in situations such as these and on all those numbers of your children who enter into such places because they are called to serve and help and reconcile. Lord, we pray for all who suffer at the hands of others. We pray for those who carry physical pains. We pray for those who are scarred by painful memories. Heal them with new peace of body and of mind, we pray. We pray for those who govern our nation and those who govern the nations of the world, that they may be blessed with your wisdom and strengthened by your grace to do what is right and seek above all other considerations the good of all your children. We bring you our personal prayers for ourselves and others known to us. Those people we name before you in the silence of our hearts, asking that you would bless them in accordance with your loving purpose and your faithful will. And we ask, Almighty God, that you would bless your church's ministry in the world. Make us faithful in our living, loving in our serving, and attractive in our witnessing for Jesus' sake. And in your goodness, make us part answer to our prayers until at the last, with all your faithful people, we see you face to face and rejoice in the fulfillment of your will and the perfect joy of your eternal kingdom. We pray in Jesus' words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now may the blessing of the eternal God be upon us, upon our work, our worship, and our witness, his light to guide us, his presence to strengthen us, his love to unite us, now and always. Amen. Thank you.